So I hope everybody can see and hear me clearly. I'm rather excited because this is my first uh, PowerPoint presentation per Zoom. Uh, I hope everything will go smoothly. So, but first of all, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being present at today's Zoom meeting, uh, which gives me the opportunity to explain my research project that has been generously funded by the very first Barry Friedberg and Charlotte Moss Grant Award. And I'm truly very proud and uh, grateful for this promotion uh, because it helps us to advance our efforts in, uh, uh, in finding a cure for exfoliation glaucoma, which is, as we all know, the mission of the Glaucoma Foundation. So you may be interested in who is doing the work. Uh, this is my team involved in exfoliation research and our labs are located in this building, the ophthalmological department in Erlangen. I myself entered into exfoliation research about 30 years ago uh, when the former department chair, Professor Fritz Naumann, got me interested in this particular condition. At that time, Exfoliation syndrome was widely considered as a rather harmless anomaly of the eye. You can't imagine it, uh, that these times were existing. And uh, people thought this syndrome was rather mainly restricted to Scandinavian countries. So uh, later on, I was lucky enough to meet Dr. Rich, who in fact deserves all credits for bringing exfoliation to world attention and the productive interaction uh, between an experienced clinician and a curious scientist resulted, among other things, in our comprehensive survey article, uh, which in fact represents the most frequently cited paper in the field and still serves as a compendium for all aspects of the disease. Of course, it needs to be updated and this is already in progress. So owing to uh, the immediate incorporation of our research unit into a clinical environment and the financial support of several funding bodies, including uh, the Glaucoma Foundation, we were able over the years to define the nature of exfoliation syndrome as a disease of connective tissues. I will get back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, we were also able to explain the causative mechanisms of clinical complications, including glaucoma development, to improve early diagnosis, describe the systemic manifestations of the disease, elucidate the underlying molecular pathophysiology, and characterize the functional significance of newly discovered genes which increase the risk for developing exfoliation syndrome. So this is maybe not too much for 30 years of active research. Well, uh, let's get back uh, to the beginning. Uh, as just mentioned, exfoliation syndrome can be described as a disorder of connective tissues. Well, connective tissues are the ground substances which are found uh, within and in between all organs of the body and which mainly consists of cells termed fibroblasts and abundant fibers such as collagen fibers and elastic fibers. In certain diseases, we can observe an abnormal augmentation of this fibrous material and this process is termed fibrosis. While fibrotic processes can affect virtually all organs of the body, here exemplified for the liver, and you can see here the abnormal increase of this fibrous material in the liver tissue, and this typically occurs as a result of inflammation, injury, or toxic substances such as alcohol, nicotine, and others. And you can imagine that these alterations, of course, interfere with normal organ function, so fibrosis is always deleterious. So as mentioned, exfoliation syndrome has been also characterized as a fibrotic process because it's associated with the excessive production and progressive accumulation of an abnormal fibrilla material within the eye and in many organ systems uh, throughout the body. Here, for example, seen on ocular surfaces, the red stuff here, and also here as fibroma deposits in heart muscle uh, tissue. And in fact, most clinic, if not all clinical complications arise 
from accumulation of these fibrillar deposits. Let me explain. Glaucoma, for, ex for example, by far the most severe ocular complication is caused by obstruction of the outflow pathways for the drainage of uh, the ocular fluid by uh, obstruction uh, with these uh, fibrilla uh, deposits here. Um, and you can see how these uh, abnormal fibrilla deposits labeled with the arrows here uh, obstruct the pores of this meshwork uh, forming the outflow tissue. This would be this structure here. So, and if the drainage of the aqueous humor is impaired in that way, this will lead to an increase in rise in intraocular pressure. And in fact, I'm so sorry to jump in. Uh, yes, no problem. I want to ask everybody to mute ourselves because I hear echo back uh, Ursula's voice. So uh, let's all mute ourselves so we just can hear Ursula's voice. And also, so far, so good, everybody. Good. Okay. So okay. Let's mute ourselves, please. Thanks. So. We just arrived at an increase in intraocular pressure by a blockage of the outflow pathways with this abnormal fibrilla material. And in fact, there is a direct correlation between the amount of this fibrilla material and intraocular uh, pressure. And the elevated intraocular pressure then acts on and damages the most vulnerable part of the eye. Let me see whether I can get this running. Yes, here you see how this increased intraocular pressure uh, acts on and damages the most vulnerable part of the eye, the optic nerve head at the posterior uh, pole, resulting in glaucoma. And similarly, the fibrilla deposits found throughout the body, uh, here, for example, again in the heart tissue, this time labeled in green, and also here in uh, blood vessel walls. Uh, these uh, deposits may be responsible for the cerebrovascular and cardiovascular complications known to be associated uh, with exfoliation to occur more frequently in exfoli exfoliation patients than in age-matched control subjects or in other words. The presence of exfoliation almost doubles the risk for these uh, systemic problems, including cerebrovascular disease, coronary heart disease, aortic aneurysms, and others in addition. So concluding from this, if we had a chance to prevent the formation of this fibrilla material and stop the fibrotic process, we would perhaps be able to control the disease. So well, uh, this abnormal fibrotic process is influenced by genetic factors, environmental factors, lifestyle factors, quite in the sense of a complex disease. Up to date, seven genes uh, have been identified uh, to be associated with exfoliation with... Is there a question? No. With uh, LOXA1, you may have heard about this gene as the most important genetic risk factor. And interaction of these genetic factors with environmental factors, most importantly, sun exposure, UV radiation, and lifestyle factors, including antioxidant diet, folate intake, and uh, coffee consumption, uh, this interaction uh, is supposed uh, to result in the development of the exfoliation uh, phenotype. So recently, the International Exfoliation Genetics Consortium has identified a novel genetic variant associated with exfoliation syndrome, which led us uh, to the involvement of the vitamin A metabolic pathway in exfoliation uh, syndrome and glaucoma. How did this work? So through a long series of experiments, we found out that this genetic variant has an influence on the expression levels of a specific protein named STRA6. And this is the vitamin A receptor, which regulates the uptake of vitamin A from the blood into the cells. And due to this genetic uh, effect, of this variant in exfoliation patients, this critical receptor 
is significantly down-regulated in cells and tissues of exfoliation patients compared to age-matched uh, controls by almost 50%. This was a rather exciting finding for us, which of course directed our interest to the vitamin A pathway, just starting from this receptor. So just to give you a rough idea of this pathway, vitamin A or retinol is an essential nutrient which is required for eye development and uh, function. So following its dietary uptake, it is, uh, this uh, vitamin A or retinol is transported in the blood by carrier proteins and uh, taken up uh, via this STRA6 receptor into the target cells. Within the cells, it is further processed into retinoic acid. Retinoic acid is the active form, the active metabolite of vitamin A, and this retinoic acid then migrates into the nucleus to exert its cellular effects, which is regulation of gene expression. So this entire pathway has attracted broad interest in medical sciences uh, because its dysregulation has been associated with a number of ocular diseases, including glaucoma, as well as systemic conditions, including fibrotic and neurodegenerative uh, disorders. In Alzheimer's disease, for example, Vitamin A deficiency facilitates the deposition of fibrilla beta amyloid plaques in the brain of mice, whereas administration of vitamin A or its active form, uh, retinoic acid, has been shown to reduce these brain deposits markedly. So vitamin A deficiency can also induce fibrotic alterations in many organ systems, here, for example, in lung tissue, resulting in pulmonary fibrosis. Again, you can appreciate here the augmentation of this fibrous materials in lung uh, tissue. And conversely, the administration of vitamin A or its active form retinoic acid has been shown to attenuate or even revert these alterations getting almost back to normal control levels. So based on this background information, we hypothesized that vitamin A deficiency could be also involved in exfoliation-associated fibrosis. So we moved on to analyze all components of the entire pathway including binding proteins, receptor we had already uh, examined, but all the converting enzymes and the nuclear receptors and so on in tissue samples of exfoliation patients and controls. And uh, amazingly, we found virtually all components, not only the receptor STRA6, to be significantly diminished in exfoliation patients. And this is only an example for two tissues, the iris in the anterior segment of the eye and the retina in the posterior segment of the eye, but many other tissues are affected as well. So you may wonder whether exfoliation patients have an insufficient dietary uptake of vitamin A, but the serum vitamin A levels uh, were found to be still within the normal range quite comparable to controlled patients, at least in this small pilot study, but larger sample sizes, only 10 patients were included, are of course uh, required for any meaningful uh, conclusions, and this is also part of the current uh, project. So by looking at tissue sections of uh, control and exfoliation eyes, it was quite obvious that those cells and tissues which showed signs of vitamin A deficiency as reflected by reduced uh, expression of this receptor, STRA6, here compared to control, a heavy green label, here very diminished label. And uh, these tissues and cells uh, accumulated the abnormal fibrillar material stained in red here on the surface. And also here the same in the periphery of blood vessels. 
So there appeared to be a direct relationship between impaired cellular vitamin A metabolism and fibrotic material accumulations. And of course, we next wanted to prove such a relationship by using a cell model. We used a human fibroblast obtained uh, during cataract surgery, which in culture produce abundant fibrillar material labeled in red here, uh, resembling exfoliation material in composition. In these cells, we mimicked an impaired vitamin A metabolism by means of genetic knockdown of uh, one of the key components of the pathway, this is a nuclear receptor. And this intervention, in fact, induced an upregulation of all genes involved in the formation of exfoliation material, together with some more general fibrosis marker genes. And also on the protein level, this interruption of the metabolic pathway resulted in a markedly increased deposition of fibrillar material by these cells, hence in fibrosis. This is actually what fibrosis is looking like. So then conversely, and this was probably the most exciting part of the experiment, stimulation of the pathway by administration of vitamin A or retinoic acid. In this case, we used all transretinoic acid, which is a mayor occurring form of retinoic acid. And this resulted in suppression of most of the genes involved in exfoliation material formation and consistently also in suppression of deposition of fibrillar materials in our culture model compared to controls. So, the opposite effects of pathway interruption and pathway stimulation can again be appreciated here. Fibrotic changes uh, following interruption of the pathway using a chemical inhibitor in this time, last time we used this genetic knockdown, um, and uh, can, can, can be seen here. And here, a striking suppression of fibrosis following stimulation of the pathway with all transretinoic acid. And this also goes along with increased or reduced expression of LOXA1, which also plays a major role in these fibrotic processes. So these findings suggested that administration of vitamin A or retinoic acid may represent a promising avenue as a novel antifibrotic uh, treatment strategy for exfoliation syndrome and uh, exfoliation glaucoma. So in, this is, was a time point where we submitted our research proposal to the Glaucoma Foundation. And in our proposed research project now, we plan to investigate uh, the uh, role of the vitamin A pathway in exfoliation-associated fibrosis and its potential as an antifibrotic therapeutic target in much more de detail. Uh, specifically, we want to characterize the alterations in tissues, blood, and aqueous humor samples of exfoliation patients and match controls on a broader basis. We want to do those, uh, those response curves and uh, many things we did not have the time to so far. And uh, next, we want to substantiate the causative relationship between dysregulated vitamin A metabolism and fibrosis, not only in one, but in several cellular models by genetic knockdown and also pharmacological pathway inhibitors, and also find out the underlying molecular mechanisms. And finally, we want to evaluate the beneficial effects of pathway restoration on these fibrotic processes by administration of natural retinoids, such as all transretinoic acid and retinoid palmitate, but also synthetic retinoids, which may be more stable than the natural occurring forms. So uh, eventually this project should open new opportunities for a better understanding of the complex biology of the disease and also help to identify new targets for pharmacological intervention. So at the very end, I would like to truly thank the Glaucoma Foundation and its president, Elena Sturman, for their continuing dedication to exfoliation syndrome in glaucoma. 
of course, also the Barry Friedberg and Charlotte Moss Foundation for this wonderful award, and all of you for supporting the Glaucoma Foundation and enabling research projects like this one. Thank you for your time in the, very mo in the early morning and interest, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions and to uh, deepen any of these uh, really only roughly uh, addressed uh, questions uh, during this talk. Thank you very much. So I suggest to remove the slides so we can see everybody and if anybody has a question, yes. unmute yourself and please ask the question. Yes, sure. Excellent. So now we can see who participated and... Uh... So I do have a question if it's okay. okay. Um, so Ursula, it seems to me that if you could delay fibroid found, uh, formation, is this sort of um, different than a cure, right? If, however, since this occurs so late in life, a delay of 10 or 15 years could act as a pseudo cure, right? Because if you get it when you're 95 and 99, maybe it's not such a horrible proposition. And it's not quite the cure path, but rather the delay of gain, or the delay of occurrence proposition. Has that entered the minds of the people looking into this? So, uh, I mean, it's it, maybe it still can be still defined as a type of cure because we think uh, the fibrotic process is really the cause for all the secondary uh, complications, particularly glaucoma development, as I as I mentioned. And uh, so, of course, you have you cannot treat anybody, uh, but if you uh, if you uh, watch the first indication and now we are in a situation where we can really uh, diagnose exfoliation syndrome at a rather early stage uh, because we now know how, how the subtle signs, the clinical signs look like. And it, in that case, if you can really uh, prevent the continuing formation, which really continues uh, as a lifelong process. If you manage to keep that under control, I would say this is a type of cure because, uh, I mean, we would not really suffer from exfoliation syndrome per se, but we want to, do not want to have the intraocular pressure uh, rising up and, uh, um, uh, and also uh, induce glaucoma development. And that's why uh, it's, it's, of course, a very naive vision, uh, I, I uh, um, uh, admit, but I think this could be still a basis for, for uh, <laughs> uh, so this research project. Uh, Ur Ursula, uh, I have a question from Ken Mortensen, who, who's muted himself and whose connection is not great. So he's <coughs> asking, is a vitamin A pill as effective as getting vitamin A through diet choices? I did not get the last part. So if, if I, if I is the pill as effective as getting it? Vitamin A pill is as effective as getting it through uh, diet. Um, you, you, you're now asking for a difference between maybe uh, vitamin A or retinoic acid drops and uptake from the diet. Yes, correct. Okay, I think there is a difference because uh, I don't think exfoliation patients or uh, all people living in industrialized countries really suffer from vitamin A deficiency. This is something which occurs in developing countries, but uh, in uh, industrialized Western nations, I think this is never the case. Uh, perhaps we can talk about a vitamin A inadequacy, but never insufficiency, uh, deficiency. And uh, so I think the eye drops are locally, uh, of course, um, acting at uh, the eye, where it, uh, particularly the anterior segment, where this fibrotic process is manifesting. And uh, the, uh, also, the retinoic acid eye drops are already used in ophthalmology. This is a nice thing about that because uh, we know that retinoic acid has wound healing properties and in patients who have corneal surface uh, defects, so epithelial ulceration and such things, uh, retinoic acid is a very e effective agent also for cutaneous wound healing. And so we have a uh, preparations, formulations already um, uh, prepared, 
where retinoic acid is encapsulated in nanoparticles. And these are very effective in penetrating the cornea into the anterior segment of the eye and could perhaps this is at least a, the vision, could perhaps uh, exert the beneficial effect there locally where it's needed. Of course, it does not treat, as you, as you say, the systemic uh, part of the disease, but at least I think still we are not so much afraid of the systemic manifestations, which are relatively rare compared to the development of glaucoma. Thank you. Uh, uh, Elena, I, I have a short question. Yes, please, Baldo. Uh, it was a good presentation. Um, uh, so this is um, supplementing retinoid acid is only effective to prevent further deposit and deterioration. Right? It wouldn't reverse existing deposit. Can you mm, confirm, no, I, please? Yeah. I think so, yes. Uh, also, it has been shown in animal models uh, that uh, these fibrotic alterations can, uh, for uh, at least for some part, be reverted. But I, I would not go so far, actually. I think I would, uh, I would suspect uh, you could probably slow the process down uh, or attenuate uh, the, the progress and, uh, and reduce the speed of accumulation of material, but certainly not uh, reverse. It. I, I don't think so. So Ursula, Dave Fellows here, great presentation, exciting results. So what is the trabecular meshwork, the specific target tissue that you would be going after? Um, yes, I think you could not really target that. Uh, so in where, is go ahead. Yes, I, I think you would probably uh, influence or affect with your drops uh, all tissues of the anterior segment because I think uh, what, what is supposed that will be happening is that the uh, nanoparticles with the retinoic acid will penetrate uh, the cornea and um, will be distributed through the aqueous humor, through all uh, parts of the uh, anterior segment of the eye. But uh, these are exactly the tissues which contribute to the formation of this fibrilla material. All tissues which are based by the aqueous humor uh, participate in the abnormal formation of this exfoliation material. And so I think this would be an ideal setting where we could uh, test it. Um, Unfortunately, we have no animal model uh, available for exfoliation, as you know, and so we have to um, lay the foundation in our cell models and then uh, try to find a cooperation partner for some uh, clinical, long-term clinical study. Yeah. May I ask you, Sal? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. This is Sal with a follow-up question to that. So. It seems to me if you have 1.7 uh, or just roughly call it two times uh, this coronary relationship that you presented in the slide, yeah. maybe an animal model that's already in use by coronary folks would be in some way helpful for this, right? So is that the natural target for the cooperation of an animal model creation? And is that something the uh, foundation should be funding? Because the animal model, the absence of this animal model is rate limiting, I think, to progress relative to resolution. So you want to jumpstart that animal model and perhaps jumpstarting that animal model comes from interaction with the coronary field. Does that make some sense? I would say that uh, coronary uh, artery disease or heart disease in general is such a broad field and um, I'm not sure whether we really, I think we cannot find a specific model by going that way. So uh, I have been uh, taking part in so many think tanks and we were discussing how to create and to generate an animal model for years. And because it's a complex disease, which is not only uh, um, um, caused by one gene uh, defect, by, but by many gene genetic factors, by the environmental factors and the life cycle. This interaction can hardly be simulated uh, and uh, re uh, reproduced in an animal model. And all people gave up <laughs> in the meantime. And so I'm really afraid that we have to do without an animal model for, for, for the rest of, our, of my life, at least. <laughs> yeah. 
e even the replication in a primate or non prime you know even at that level it's not easy to replicate you're suggesting i mean you know i understand the mouse it may be difficult but at the primate level um so I have, uh, I had, uh, had been in contact with a researcher, I forgot his name, who had a spontaneous glaucoma, glaucoma model in dogs, in beagle dogs. And uh, he, in fact, found um, the production of a type of material slightly resembling exfoliation fibers. And this was very promising, but somehow he disappeared from, from the uh, yeah, scientific community. So I should... Yeah, I've never heard anything uh, of him, but I should try to reactivate this connection. You're right. Maybe the, the dog model would be something worth to be followed. In the mouse, it's too complex to, you yeah. cannot really, yeah. If it would be one genetic defect, a monogenetic disease, it would be relatively easy. But complex diseases, this is dramatically uh, difficult. Yeah, Ursula, thank you, uh, thank you for bringing me back to bringing this back to my mind. <laughs> Ursula, good morning. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. This is Naj Sharif. Um, going on and, and and listening to your presentation, I think it, you know, it, it's really great to hear the insightful questions that are coming up. So, uh, you know, uh, so. Cheers to all those folks who have actually understood your presentation, which was very nicely described, and then asking these wonderful questions. So my question uh, to you is, um, if we sort of reverse engineer what may be the composition of the fibrilla material that accumulates in PECs in the eyes of these patients, um, what is the status of actually finding out what is the composition of that material? And secondly, if we were to recapitulate the content or the comp that composition in, in, in a lab and then use that to inject into the animals, especially large animal models um, uh, that were just mentioned, like a primate, is, is there any hope of actually then simulating what may be happening in the PEX patients? Thank you. Actually, we have tried this out very early in my career. So we isolated the material uh, intraoperatively. So during cataract surgery um, or glaucoma surgery, we harvested the material from the eyes of the patients, you know, picked it up from the lens surface over from all the ocular surfaces, collected this and injected this material into rabbit eyes, I think, if I remember correctly, it's so long ago, and uh, nothing uh, uh, to produce antibodies and also to probably uh, in, induce a formation of, uh, of uh, development of the disease. But actually nothing happens, uh, happened, and this might be due because the material is rather um, yeah, it's 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 not really antigenic. It's something. It's it's a it's a body um, a body material. It's familiar to the body. It's a, a kind of mixture of elastic fibers and of basement membranes and so on. A mixture of extracellular materials. Very complex mixture at that. And we still do not know what the primary um, the the primary component is that attracts all other components uh, to assemble around the core of this material. So we only we know the complex mixtures uh, quite well from a proteomic analysis, but we do not know what is a primary defect uh, and the primary component excessively produced. So also here uh, the research is really um, a little bit um, stuck. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess much success to those who are working on this in this area. So yeah. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you know, Elena, it's Sal, and maybe to Ursula. For the lay people, right? I'm not a, a, a medical doctor, engineering profession, and so to us, it always sounds so different when we step through. But maybe uh, we could have a presentation on exfoliation in its rudimentary form. So here, there putting retinol in to make an adjustment, but these fibroids, what are they? Are they proteins? Are the macrophages mm -hmm. supposed to work on them? 
is there a team M relationship where, right, there's a transition? Um, is it, uh, are the fibroids mostly a protein and therefore should you, you know, this very early understanding of exfoliation, mm -hmm. um, the presentation day was magnificent in the attempt to limit the formation slash deposits, these fibroids, mm -hmm. but, but it's probably a, a missing to many of us the early understanding of exfoliation and mm -hmm. how it all relates. Um, yeah. I had seen a presentation on breast cancer where they were talking about the macrophages conspiring with the, with the uh, cancerous uh, cells and bringing them into the bloodstream and then metastasis being created throughout the whole body through that not regular, not normal relationship between the macrophage. So whose job is it in the body to get rid of these deposits? Why do they stay there? I know we're getting rid of them and we could reduce them by um, vitamin A, but, but how do they get there? Who, who, what, there's some garbage truck supposed to come around and take it and they're not, right? So this sort of early understanding, because we use exfoliation in every board meeting 200 times. And the full understanding of this process in the early beginning is I have some sense of it, so I only speak for myself, but I imagine many other board members could benefit from understanding that, especially when we talk about working on more than exfoliation. Yeah. Well, you'd have to have a very good understanding of exfoliation to decide we should do more, yeah. if that makes any sense to you yeah, folks. Yeah, yeah. I agree yeah. with you completely, and I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I'm sorry if I did not touch touch these uh, basic um, uh, basic understandings. And of course, I could also give some uh, insights into that because, of course, we have also worked on the composition and uh, on the production, um, uh, the cells involved in the production and, and such things. And during these think tanks, I repeatedly gave these types of presentation for a general understanding. And so far, it can probably only say uh, I don't want to to make it too uh, too um, extensive that this material is most closely resembling the elastic fibers of connective tissues so it's really composed of these elastic microfibrils uh, which are similar to sonular fibers and which are aggregated and cross-linked by this LOXA1 enzyme in an abnormal uh, way, in an abnormal uh, manner. And um, so that's why we have uh, defined exfoliation syndrome as a specific type of elastosis or elastic microfibrillopathy. Pathy. But around the cores of these elastic fibers, we have a bunch of glycoproteins, proteoglycans, all kinds of stuff which really secondarily interact and coat the, the fibrous cores with uh, other, other materials. So yeah, just to give you a rough idea that this is a, a more an elastic fiber related uh, process and uh, why this is uh, produced, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I would I would commend Ursula. The presentation was wonderful. If you assume the if the assumption is uh, the fibroids are bad, then your pro your process is how to make them be less. The question about the first step is not to do with understanding your pro your presentation, which was magnificently clear. Um, the early building block information for the lay board members of the Cloma Foundation is where I think some time could be spent. But but to no way take away from the presentation because I understood it exceedingly well. So I, I think you did a fine, fine job. And I appreciate the time and bringing it to our level, right? Because you could easily have lost us in the first 30 seconds if you wished to accomplish that task. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your input, for your interest, and also for stimulating questions, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ursula, it's uh, Barry Friedberg. And uh, right. I'd like to say that this was better the second time than it was the first time. When I heard it. Uh, because and, the first time was without slides, you know? You had to imagine that. all the things I was uh, talking about in your head. <laughs> and also the experience was enhanced by uh, the very good questions that folks raised. So thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to echo all the things, Ursula, spectacular presentation, great questions. I recorded this whole Zoom session I will post it on our website uh, as, as a PowerPoint presentation. I will also send an email uh, with Ursula's voice and slides to our constituents uh, without the uh, answering question portion of it. And uh, 
we should do it more often. This is incredibly helpful to all of the board members uh, in understanding what kind of research we support. And uh, as a goal, I think we should do it at least you know, once a quarter just to touch base uh, where the research is and basic understanding and advanced understanding. But I feel that everybody found it incredibly illuminating and helpful and we are very grateful. Yeah, I'm, I'm available for any type of topic you would be interested uh, in in more detail. Glaucoma development, uh, basic uh, science of, of exfoliation process. So, uh, well, you know, 30 years are uh, some, some knowledge accumulated over the years. <laughs> okay. Thank for sure, for much. sure. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, day, everybody, and thank you so much for joining, and great thanks to Ursula. Thank you. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Well done. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Dan. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. And stay well. Stay you well. too, Bye. you too. Bye.